Right, so I've been working with augmented reality for about seven years as an art form. I thought I'd get, give you, show you a broad swath of content, different sorts of applications, but, um, but really in the cultural and social field. Let's see if I can figure out this clicker. Um, there's a Ford. Okay, but since there's kind of a uh, overlap between um, uh, VR and AR, and the VR pieces I've done ha uh, were really large worlds, and that's where I'd like to head at some point when I get my slides back up. Um, there we go. Um, with, uh, with the AR, so um, very quick. I started out 23 years ago, 1984, uh, 1994, sorry, when uh, 3D interactive VR first became possible on PCs instead of $100,000 workstations. I was head of the group that did the Starbright World, the first online multi-user world for children, working in close collaboration with Steven Spielberg. And because we were working with seriously ill children, it was clear from the start, no stereo, no headsets. The kids had nausea anyway, thank you. And they had enough machines in their lives. So they, should, um, they saw the world on a monitor, came out of their hospital beds into the playrooms, ran off as very low resolution avatars, as you could see, but uh, with the freedom that they didn't have in their real lives and uh, hope that might, they might run into Steven Spielberg, who, of course, when we asked, what's your avatar, he said, E.T. So that was clear from the start. And I'm really happy this year to be, <laughs> to be a Google artist in residence, working with Tilt Brush, and finally really get into the high quality, immersive stereo uh, VR. In between these two points, I created a number of large virtual worlds beyond Manzanar, which dealt with a very topical uh, theme, the um, imprisonment of minorities <laughs> in times of crisis. But as a monocular projection on a large screen, because I wanted, oh, can we douse the lights here in the front? Because we can barely see this. I'm gonna wait. Yeah, that's much better, thank you. Because I wanted, for instance, the internees, who were all very old at that time, to be able to walk through the Manzanar internment camp with their children and grandchildren. And many told me this was really the first time they were able to talk about that experience because what do you do? You go to a seven-year-old and said, when I was your age, I was in a prison camp in the, in the desert. You can't really convey that experience. But the, the kids got on the joystick, running through the camp, and then grandma or grandpa says, when I was your age, I was there. And you can start a dialogue about it. I did some other worlds, this really fantasy world, the viewpoint of a, uh, of a Japanese uh, female artist looking at the exotic, far-off, unknowable West sort of a Buddha meets Dante piece, and then the virtual wall piece where you could walk along the Berlin Wall in the West, but if you tried to do that in the East, you would be arrested and interrogated. We're really proud of our interrogation sequence. So I got involved in augmented reality, and uh, actually on October 9th, 2010, when friends of mine realized that mobile uh, AR was far enough along so we could put our artworks wherever we, we pleased without asking first permission from the people who were, whose space we were actually invaded, for instance, the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. So I put this piece here, the art critic face matrix, which seems to be screaming, what, you call this art, denying its own existence as a valid art form? It's still there. And then the question was, of course, what do we do after that? How do we top an invasion into MoMA? Well, I, I go to the Venice Biennial every time it happens, and I said, okay, guys, uh, who wants to go with me? So we, we did that, and these two things really got us in the art, uh, digital art media history books. So this is a, uh, one of the pieces that I set there. It's about censorship of artists, shades of absence. This is the public space of Piazza San Marco, and these artists here whose erased silhouettes are standing enclosed in these terms of censorship include also artists that were censored at the Venice Biennial itself. So this piece is also uh, another in the series is in the closed curatorial protected space of the Giardini, the Holy of Holies at the Venice Biennial. And it has the heads of artists whose works have caused them to be arrested or threatened with physical violence. And this was happening right at the time when Ai Weiwei had disappeared from the face of the earth and we later found he had been imprisoned by his own government. 
So even, even though he was an insider in the art world, that was no protection uh, when, when the government really was against his art. Here's a very different piece that I did for the Occupy New York, um, Occupy Wall Street, in, 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 uh, first in New York, but um, you're standing in a rain of gold uh, coins, and I've set it so that you can get it anywhere in the world. These are all, by the way, geolocative uh, uh, AR pieces. So that you can stand in front of your favorite object of protest, make a screenshot, and it's an instant commentary um, that you can use uh, anytime, anywhere. I used the same sort of form uh, in a very different way for gold segen, golden blessings. I asked people to answer the question, how much do you need? to be happy on their whiteboard, and then took a photograph of them augmented with these lucky coins, printed it out on the spot, and gave it to them as a lucky charm. And this fit in so perfectly when I happened to be teaching in Singapore during the uh, Chinese New Year, and they asked me to show a piece because in, in the Chinese tradition, you have, for instance, these red money packets where usually older people give money to younger people as sort of an auspicious good luck charm that it will increase their, their money flow. And so, again, the uh, photographs, which are the lucky charms, were put in the red packets with a little cutout, and the person got one, and the other one went into my wall hanging, inspired by Chinese New Year decorations. So, in fact, Liverpool gave our artist group Manifest.ar a commission to work with scientists at Liverpool John Moores University with biosensors. And my, uh, I, together with uh, Will Pappenheimer, a colleague of mine in, in the artist group, chose to work with the uh, heart rate monitors, which are pretty robust. I think there's probably better technology now, but that was a while ago. And we were using the heartbeat of the user to generate augmented reality vegetation as they walk through Liverpool. You had to choose, however, do you want to be an indigenator defending the native biome or an exoticator spreading biome shifts due to climate change? And once you make this choice, you're, you're so to speak part of the problem or part of the solution, whichever you want to decide. And here's swaths of vegetation, virtual vegetation that we planted then in Liverpool. Uh, the botanical, um, the exotic plants were from botanical prints taken here uh, at, from the World Museum. Now they're taking over the World Museum. And then the uh, native plants are here defending the River Mersey against all foreigners. So there's a little bit of an undertone here, which unfortunately we haven't been able to really play up like we would like to. But um, it hopefully gets people thinking a little bit uh, more about about subsidiary issues on this problem. Another piece in, uh, in England, in uh, um, working with Dominic Fitch at King's Coll College London in this uh, shade of the shard. And Dr. Fitch is a world expert on palinopsia, visual disorders. In fact, at some point later, I realized that the entire first chapter of the book, Hallucinations by Oliver Sacks, is talking about Dr. Fitch's work. So uh, polyopia is one form of this, where things in your visual field seem to separate and multiply and spread across the field. Another one is illusory visual spread, where textures repeat across other objects, seeming to like, jump from one to the other. And in the process of creating this work, of course, I was asking Dr. Fitch a lot of questions about the experience of having these uh, visual disorders. And I was asking, is it, do they fade in and fade out, or is it more like a hard cut? If you turn your head, does it turn with you? Is it behind you or just in front of you? And at some point he said, you know, I don't know. And in fact, I've looked and there aren't any studies that have been done asking that sorts of questions. All the studies have been, so to speak, static questions. So this was really pleasing to me that, you know, artists, scientists, collaborations are often fraught with a lot of tensions, but this one worked really wonderfully. And my artistic uh, explorations helped him to discover questions that had actually never been asked in the entire field of uh, illusory of, of visual disorders. So now a very different project that I did here in New York, up in East Harlem, worked together with the Caribbean Cultural Center and the African Diaspora Institute. We got a Rockefeller grant to put the history and the culture and the art of 
the uh, uh, New York, New the Puerto Rican American community up in their own neighborhood of East Harlem, which of course is, is being threatened by gentrification. So for instance, Oliver Rios grew up being a street artist and also documenting his and other artworks that were done by graffiti artists and used AR to put those works back where they used to be but have in the meantime been eradicated or maybe the building itself has been destroyed. And Yasmin Hernandez created this Taino Native American bate, a sacred space from the Taino uh, uh, Indians who were the original population of, in Puerto Rico before, as you <laughs> probably expect, they got wiped out by um, diseases and other forms of violence. So uh, the Taino Towers is a big uh, social housing complex in East um, Harlem, and she put then this original uh, uh, Taino Indian bate space in the midst of their large inner courtyard. This is the piece that I contributed to it, where I asked people in the community, what makes El Barrio feel like home to you? And I took their handwritten answers, signed with their names, and transformed them into these golden augments that hover around the, uh, the building on 125th Street. The last piece I want to show you, Gardens of the Anthropocene, was a commission from the Seattle Art Museum. It ran um, last year, right at the time when Pokemon Go was hitting. So some smart journalist wrote this article about it saying, Pokemon Go like artwork, and that got a lot of hits. And I'm, I, I worked with climate scientists at the UW to find out what sort of plants would um, not only adapt, but also thrive as the climate ch in Seattle changed. And uh, to, make it, to make it clear that you're maybe not going to just have a tropical vacation in Seattle in the future, I mutated them so they'd be a bit more menacing. So the pink farewell to spring, if you look at them directly, they're sensitive to the gaze and they enlarge to try and engulf you. And you might notice that the bullwhip kelp that usually float around with the fronds at the water level, they're flying high above you. So it's visualizing also the, the raising water levels. And now um, I'd like to run this video showing a work that, um, these are the, uh, the uh, uh, red algae that form the red tides, the toxic red tides, that you might know make it uh, um, poisonous to eat shellfish. Can we run the building? Go ahead and run it, right. Okay, and so um, it turns out they exist not only on the uh, West Coast, but also on the East Coast. So when I was given a commission by Boston Cyber Arts to put a couple of augments in the, at the Salem Maritime Museum, this is one of the ones that I've done. You see it here on, on site. So of course, this is, this is an artistic in interpretation, interpretation, my giant, uh, big uh, red algae pods, Alexandrium spinning around, spitting out their poisonous pods. But you know, they're floating around at kind of your chest level, the water, uh, implying that the water level has raised. And these are, are very real. They're causing uh, toxic selfish poisoning right now. They are projected to increase in the future due to global warming. And this is really, I think, one way, for instance, that AR can be used to give people a very much closer emotional relationship to some of, the, some of the dangers that will come with global warming in the future. So I'm going to leave it at that, and I hope this gave you a little bit broader idea of what you can do with this medium. Thank you.